Hi, my name is Stu McMillan. I'm the CEO and the short sprint coach for Altus. This video is a review of the 2021 competitive season for American sprinter, Chris Royster. In it, I answer the question, how did Chris get so good this year? He came into the season with a PR of 1020, and he actually ran faster than that eight times, which is pretty good. It's especially good when you consider the context. You see, Chris is 29. He works full time, and he's ran about the same time for the last four years, making a few jumps each year on either his PR or his consistency, but nothing really to show that he'd be capable of dropping his season average by almost two tenths of a second over his last competitive season. Hopefully, through watching this, you don't only get a better idea of who Chris is, but you can also pick up some of the lessons that we learned, as well as some of the mistakes that we made. I'll talk about the reasons why Chris had such a good year, but also hopefully provide some ideas for you on how to go about your own training. So let's start things off with a quick rundown of who is Chris Royster. As I said, Chris is 29 years old. He's an American sprinter who went to college at the University of South Carolina, from where he graduated in 2015. Then he joined Altus for the 2016-17 season, where he worked with first coach Dustin Imdick, and then coach Jason Hetler, before I took over his training in 2019. He worked full-time at Roadrunner Sports as a manager of the Scottsdale branch, and like all athletes to try to juggle working and training full-time, he's really struggled to find that right balance. His season's best in his first year after college was 10.30. He dropped that to 10.22, which was a new PR in his first year with Altus, and then pretty much ran the same again for the next two seasons before a year off due to COVID, and then finally this year, his breakout season. Over the last three seasons, his season average has improved from 10.35 and 10.37 in 2018 and 19 to 10.18 this past season. So that's the context. Now let's get into some of the reasons why I thought he improved, as, as well as some maybe some of the things that he attributed it to, as you'll hear throughout. Firstly, and I really don't think this cannot be overstated, is opportunity. You see, so many of the reasons why elite sprinters run elite times is not only because they're elite, but because they have the opportunity to do so. They run on fast tracks, generally with really good wins against really fast people, a lot. This is one of the reasons why being a sub-elite sprinter is such a grind. You simply don't have those opportunities, especially in the U.S., now, one of the things that's come from COVID is an increase in U.S.-based competitions. Travel to Europe was limited because of travel restrictions, and so some great people came together to put on a high-quality U.S. circuit. I still today don't think that the community of track and field in America realize how much they owe people like Paul Doyle and Jesse Williams for their efforts these past few years, especially in 2021. For Chris... He got to race against high-level competition almost every time out, rather than just once in a blue moon. Here's Chris talking about it. You know, I would run in some, some meets that were running against some fast guys, but it wasn't really on a consistent basis. So uh, a lot of the times I would have to try to go out there and push myself. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say necessarily have anybody race against, but as far as somebody that can really run 9-9 or, you know, something like that. I just wasn't in the races with those guys. So um, for this year, for me to be in uh, a race with them guys, you know, uh, consistently, I um, feel like I just learned how to, you know, learn how to compete. Um, like I said, you know, and just you know, ultimately, I feel like if, you, if you're you in a fast race, ultimately, whether you win or lose, you end up, you can PR. Um, so like I said, you know, that was the most important thing is getting a race with these guys. And, you know, hopefully just you know, improve enough to where I can, you know, compete with them on a consistent um, basis. Many of these meets also put on rounds, which, if you ask any sprinter, is always a plus. Chris ran in meets that had rounds six times this season, running faster in the final than in the rounds in all but one of them. The other thing that COVID provided is one of the reasons why results seem to be so good across the board in the sprints this year. 2020 was a down year for almost everyone, so whether they use this year as a mental break or a physical break, whether they use it to get healthy, to work on their mechanics, or maybe they even use it to train harder for a year. Whatever the reason, it seemed like 
most track and field athletes had a really good season in 2021. With Chris specifically, we trained as a group up until about the middle of March in 2020, and then he was by himself for the remainder of the year. He trained solo for three to four days a week, on the grass, so probably had a nice mental and physical break from the stress of working so hard over the previous few years. So often the work we do with an athlete is influenced by what he or she looks like. At least it has been with me. Chris is the same. Chris is six foot. He was about 195 pounds. He's a really strong and muscular guy. So there's an assumption that he would respond better to more power speed work, more intensity, less volume. Now, you might have the opposite thought if you've got a really skinny guy, right? Okay, this guy is clearly not good because he's so powerful. It's because of his work capacity or his elasticity. And so you train him that way. See, Chris is good not because he is strong, not because he is elastic, and not because his technique is great. He is good, at least partly, because he has really good capacity. He's a grinder, and so he needs those opportunities to grind. So even though this kind of sits outside of my own philosophy, rather than fighting this, I needed to come to terms with it. So I had to program in these opportunities to grind. Here's Chris talking about where his love for the longer stuff comes from. I like the fact that we did a, you know, I like doing longer runs. So I know there was an extended period of time where we was doing a lot of 40 second runs, 30 second runs. And, you know, just from my past and just learning from my background and, you know, just being at South Carolina, um, you would train for real, honestly, like a quarter mile. So having that background, I feel like, you know, um, just even through high school, just knowing that I need that longer stuff. The other side of this coin, though, is the fact that an athlete's greatest strength is also often their greatest weakness. So while Chris's greatest strength may be his work capacity and his ability to push himself in practice, to grind, too often this became the primary focus and he'd lose any sense of the importance of rhythm. He'd just end up muscling everything. So I feel like, you know, this year, you know, I feel like I've grown mentally in that way, um, learning to just, you know, um, by working smarter, not harder. Um, there'll be days, of course, where we'll have that type of environment, you know, um, where it's block work or something like that. But, you know, just being smart with my training, um, I feel like this year I learned a lot, um, whether it's, you know, dieting and just knowing that there's a lot more that I can improve on. Um, it ultimately, I feel like, can help me in the long run. So, you know, in regards to training, you know, I still want to work hard, but, you know, it would definitely be a, a, a managed um, work hard and, you know, We'll, we'll, we'll figure it out for sure. I had spoken to Chris about the importance of rhythm a lot over the last couple of years. He'd continually ask me, Coach, how do we get faster? And I'd just tell him, well, Chris, just keep doing the things you're doing now, and you'll get better and better at doing them. More and more coordinated. Your mechanics are really solid. You're powerful enough. The better guys just do what you're doing in a more efficient way. They're more rhythmical than you. While you're still muscling things a little bit, the other guys are smooth. So just keep working at smoothing things out. But this is hard to do when you're trying to run as fast as you can, so I deliberately looked at ways to slow him down. In essence, we went all in on submaximal work, with a huge focus on being smooth and rhythmical. So I had him do most of his speed work in what we call pretty rep speed, where the focus is just to look pretty not necessarily to run fast. In fact, we kept him under 95% intensity in training all year long. We did not run one single session at true maximum velocity during the entire 2021 season. Of course, he still ran fast. 95% is still pretty quick. And he competed quite a lot, so he did have opportunities to run maximally. Now, if I didn't ask him to go to the well in practice, he just found it easier to be smooth. Now, of course, you do have to run super fast eventually. You have to run as fast as you can in races, and we spoke about using those opportunities to stress test the rhythmical work we had been doing in practice. So he raced 1600s over the course of about five months. So you could say he averaged three true maximum velocity sessions every month over the course of the season, which probably isn't enough, and it's one thing that we'll probably look to increase a little bit more in this coming season. In competition, 
The focus was on the same things we were working on in practice, building high pressure over the first half of the race, then releasing it and running with freedom at the back half. To focus only on the execution of the race and allow the increased arousal of the competition to be the intensifier. Not to necessarily try to run fast, but to run smooth. We talked about being much more calm at races and just sticking to the strategy, not chasing times. Now, anybody who's ever been a sprinter knows that this is way easier said than done, but this was a real breakthrough for Chris this season, for sure. Uh, like I said, focus on just being relaxed. Um, you know, when it's time, race time, you know, I'm not trying to get too hype. Um, like I said, just kind of stay within the moment. And, you know, uh, I think, you know, being relaxed uh, at these meets, I think, you know, it's helped me out a lot too. Again, this really drove home the importance of quality work. Not simply grinding for the sake of grinding, but treating each training session as an opportunity to work on specific things that he would need in his race. And as I said, this is something we spoke about a lot over the last few years. Everything we do in training is a rehearsal for the race. So if we don't want him to grind through a race, why would we want him to grind through a training session? In the past, his mentality at training was exactly the same as in races. He tried to muscle his way down the track, losing all sense of mechanics or tactics. It was generally a bit of a mess, and this year was much better, as Chris points out. Like I said, in the past, I would just try too hard and try to muscle the run. Of course, that wouldn't work. Um, so this year, just focusing on my pattern. Um, like I said, just you know, focusing on my race and just letting it come to me and you know, trying to make the race as easy as possible. I just focus on you know, the consistency and, you know, uh, like I said, my pattern alone. In 2016, when Chris first joined Altus, we had over 40 short sprinters. Now, this is way too many. We worked to reduce our numbers over the next few years. Till the point in 2020, the group size was just about right. I had eight in my group. That's the short sprint group. Andreas had seven in the hurdles group. And Kevin had about seven or eight in the long sprints group. But then COVID happened. And our groups just shrunk to the point where at times this past year, in my group at least, consisted only of Chris, South African sprinter Anaso Jobadwana, Jamaican sprinter Shilly Calvert, American uh, master sprinter Shag Makino, and British sprinter Jody Williams, who was training with the short sprinters, but at this point was really training for the 400. Now, Anaso headed back to South Africa for the early competition season, and then Chris was pretty much training by himself from that point onwards. Now, many might see this training by yourself as a negative, but for Chris, I really think this was a good thing. He no longer felt the pressure of having to run with guys in training. He didn't feel the need to win training every day. Now, he was better at this already, but now he had no choice. He was by himself, and he got really good at it. If I asked him to do cut down 120s from 13 seconds, for example, he'd, he'd nail it. First one would be 13 flat, then 12.8, then 12.6, then 12.4, and then 12.2. Over and over again, he proved that he could focus on himself and himself alone. Again, the focus was on pretty reps, not necessarily running fast. I think just, you know, um, I'm a workhorse, so I like to work hard. Um, so I think, you know, just, you know, gauging my energy level and stuff while, while in training, um, you know, just kind of focusing on that and, you know, having that time to, um, like I said, just focus on myself in the moment. Um, I think this year was, you know, they helped me out a lot as far as learning how to actually train as a professional and not just going hard at every rep. Chris is one of the 99% of track and field athletes who don't have sufficient support that would allow them the freedom to not work. He also had a job which kept him on his feet for eight hours a day, five, five days a week. And this is his reality and has been so since he moved to Phoenix in 2016. This past season, Chris made the gutsy call to take a three-month leave of absence from his work, with the hopes that this time off would allow him to focus not necessarily on training more, but on recovering more effectively. Now, it's tough to say if this made a significant tr contribution, to be honest, as when he opened up the season, running about the same time as he did at the end, so maybe it led to him being more consistent throughout. It definitely afforded him the opportunity to run more competitions, 
which allowed him to work on all the other things that we've discussed. And this might be something I need to take into account going forward. As I said, he opened the year running a windy 1005, which converts to a 1018, which was actually his third, third fastest run of the season converted. And it's faster than his season average. But that said, I do think better recovery was a factor, if not in the big drop in PR, at least in his consistency. And although we have previously adjusted his loading in response to his additional workload, it wasn't until he dropped it out entirely that he really put in a solid season. Chris was 10 pounds lighter this season. Here's why that matters. Higher sprint speed is determined primarily through the interaction of three variables. Higher mass-specific force, shorter ground contact times, and the direction of force application. So what this looks like in practice, it's the confluence of these three things. High force, short period of time, in the right direction. Plus one more thing. If all of these things are equal, i.e. if two athletes apply the exact same force in the exact same amount of time in exactly the same direction, the lighter athlete will win because it is mass-specific force that matters, not only force in and of itself. One of the things was definitely um, dropping weight. Um, prior to that, I was running at, you know, 190 to 195. Um, so to be able to drop down to that 180 to 185 range. Um, so I lost 10 pounds. So it was a lot um, less weight I was pushing down the track for one. Now, we need to be careful here, though, because force is still highly dependent upon mass. So if we lose too much mass, especially muscle mass, then we might just be negatively affecting their force producing ability. In addition, we might also negatively affect an athlete's psyche. If a quote-unquote power athlete feels overly skinny, this can actually have an effect in their confidence. I've seen this quite a bit. Higher relative strength and power levels, but not running as fast, as they just don't feel powerful. So word to all coaches in this, tread carefully, especially with male sprinters. Trial and error is your friend here. And it goes back to what I was talking about before with training being a rehearsal. Now, training allows you the space and the time to trial out not only different ways of moving, but different body weights. I generally like to do a little bit more hypertrophy work through the fall and the winter season, and then slowly start taking it away until the point where the athlete feels really good, fast, powerful, and elastic. And finally, one thing that a lot of people have asked me about is the impact of the new shoe technology. Did Chris improve simply because the shoes were better? Well, in a word, maybe, but probably not. Here's Chris describing his first experience with the shoes, which was actually in the Olympic trials race. Just wanted to at least test them to try them out. And, you know, my first time getting my hands on them was, you know, the day of the race. So uh, when I did get my hands on them, I'm like, ah. I'm in a gray area here. Like, I really want to wear these. I'm super excited because I just, you know, just from the reviews and, you know, I've seen people run fast and I'm like, all right, cool. It's my opportunity to try to, you know, see if they work for me. And it didn't go that well. Uh, <laughs> so, um, like I said, that was my, um, that was my first time, my first race in it was in the prelims and it just felt so different. Um, the spikes are a different type of spikes. You can't just... I don't feel like you just to jump into them, especially if you've never worn them before. So I think that was my, yeah, definitely my biggest mistake. So leaving aside the big mistake of taking this risk at the Olympic trials for a second, Chris ended up racing in the super spikes for the remainder of the season after trials. But prior to making the switch, Chris's wind-adjusted average 100-meter time was 10.25. After making the switch, it was 10.22. So a little faster, but not really that significant, right? And probably nothing that can't be explained by him just being in better shape and racing against faster people later on in the season. That said, the shoes definitely make a difference for some. But how much? This is a question that uh, my friend Kate Tolbert asked me just the other day, in fact. There's almost certainly a distribution across the population where they help most people by a certain percentage, don't help others at all, and maybe even harm some, as they obviously did with Chris at the Olympic trials. Now, it's hard to even say what the improvement is, where it stems from. There's probably a small effect on maximum velocity, 
and a larger effect on economy, leading to the ability to maintain a higher percentage of max velocity for much longer into the race. We are seeing athletes reach max velocity later and maintain it for longer, so in essence, less deceleration at the end of races. On average, at the top end of the sport, I'd guess that the shoes are worth about a tenth of a second for every hundred meters. So about a tenth in the hundred, a couple tenths in the deuce, and maybe up to about half a second for some athletes in the 400. So it will be really interesting to see if there is some sort of knock-on effect for Chris for next year, with, which will be his first year in the Super Spikes, or his first full year in the Super Spikes. Because if he can find another tenth, then he is solidly putting himself into the conversation for making the U.S. team. So I hope that was useful for you. Um, I actually had some fun going through this. It's the sort of process that we go through at the end of the season with all athletes, whether they had a breakthrough year like Chris or if they had a bad one. Learning the lessons from the debrief process is the key to moving forward. So the lessons for me from this past season with Chris is to continue doing the things that went well, getting lanes in good races, continuing to focus on work capacity and rhythm. Can he continue to improve his competitive mindset with a focus on training continues to move away from just simply grinding for the sake of grinding and continuing to dial in on the important objectives. Let's see where he ends up weight-wise, as well as how he responds to a full season wearing the new super spikes. One thing I'm definitely going to do is find more room for more high-intensity work a little bit earlier in the season, as we didn't really see as big of an improvement across the totality of the season as I'd like to see, and I'd normally would expect. Now I'm confident, and so is Chris. I don't think he's at his ceiling yet. And while it's impossible to know exactly where his ceiling is, we do know he's not there yet, so look for more improvements in 2022. Or maybe it's all just the shoes. Thanks for being interested.